Greetings, folks. John Grace, President, Investors Advantage, and the Money Doctor is in. We're going to pick up where we left off. We uh, last left you with our fat forecast for you to have a fantastic 15. And we suggested that no one likes taking New Year's resolutions out because we don't usually keep them, but we do like setting goals. And when it comes to our financial situation, we're all about setting goals, and we're suggesting that you begin this new year in figuring out what amount of money you need to achieve so that you can retire with dignity at your time frame, okay? So before we get into that, and in fact, we're going to touch on the seven sins of 401k account owners. That's what I promised we would cover, and that's because of some of the feedback we received. And speaking of feedback, if you would be so kind to simply subscribe, use the subscribe button uh, right here on this particular video so that you don't miss a thing. And if you care to, please like us on Facebook. But we're interested in what you think, and we like to see what it is you have an interest in because you're really giving us input as far as what kind of information information we're going to cover. All right. So uh, we're going to look at uh, this Fantastic 15 uh, and we want to look at our goals, but we also want to look at three factoids that we found very interesting. And the first one was that when it comes to the question, how many Americans feel that they're on track so that they have the equivalent of 80% of their income when they intend to achieve financial independence, according to Aon Hewitt, The Real Deal 2012, Retirement Income Adequacy at Large Companies, only 17% of us feel that we're on track. We'd like to raise that bar. We want to get to 18% and then 19% and keep moving that dial upwards, if you will. And that would include you. We want you to know what does it take for you to be on track so that you have the equivalent of 80% 80, 80 of what you are earning at the point at which you intend to be financially independent. Do you have to take the time to do that? It won't come in the mail like junk mail. It takes some time. Uh, this comes from U.S. News & World Report. The new ideal retirement age they're suggesting might be 67, not 50, 55, 62, maybe 67. And then they're suggesting that you prepare for being in retirement about 20 years. Now, we would su submit to you that that's the minimum, at least 20 years. And many people are going to be in retirement, you know, for 40 years, longer in retirement than on the workforce. But at least 20 years would be your goal. And that means even if you work till 70 and you plan on living to 100, in spite of your habits, right? Uh, that's 30 years. That's a long time. But we want to say to folks, don't expect that because dad died at 62 that you might live to 65 because in spite of your habits, you may discover it's well past 85 and are you going to have enough money? And then the third one, people ask us, what should we be contributing? Well, I'll tell you that answer, but first what I want you to know is when we look at, again, this is Aon Hewitt as the source, how much as a percentage of people's income do the average Americans contribute to their 401k? It seems to be about 12.1%. Now, our suggestion is going to be 15% or more. And start now. It won't get any easier, I promise you. But if you wait, the task gets more foreboding. You have to set aside exponentially more to get the same results in the same period of time, or certainly in less time. So use time to your advantage. Please start now. You won't be sorry. Looking at the seven sins of 401k account owners, we'll start with number one, greed. Greed is not good. And what happens is when people are trying to make up for lost time, sometimes they make irrational decisions where they're trying to accumulate wealth quickly and often recklessly. And then it causes all kinds of other problems for them and their families. Number two, panic. What happens with a lot of people is that react to short-term market movements without really good intentions or without planning in terms of what the consequences might be. And this can result in the immediate loss of principal. And sometimes the mood becomes one of depression for those investors who are in the panic mode too often. Number three, conformity. We look at a lot of people and when they talk about investment plans, what they often do is talk to the people they work with. And they look at the person who's good with math or the treasurer or somebody who seems to be intelligent and say, well, what are you doing? Well, that's what I'm going to do. Well, maybe that doesn't make any sense. Maybe they have $12 million and they're all in cash. You may not be able to afford that, okay? Because cash is not going to give you the kind of returns you need to achieve the results you're trying to accomplish. 
So in terms of uh, looking at other people, we're going to say just don't. You might gather some information from them, but you, you probably don't know what their intentions are. You have no idea what their goals are. That's probably a conversation you won't have. On the other hand, we do suggest that people talk about money and look at what's going on in the markets because it's one of those conversations that in this country, if you're poor, we think you're an idiot, right? You're a bum. And if you're rich, you must have been a crook. <laughs> and we have no happy medium between those two extremes. So again, what are you trying to accomplish? And being a conformist and part of the herd mentality is probably not going to help you get the results that you're trying to achieve. Number four, ignorance. And I specifically mean instead of throwing darts at investment vehicles or trying something to see how it pans out and then you might increase your contributions, what's your goal? That's the most important question I can ask you, and it's the most important question you must answer. No one's going to do it for you. So rather than being ignorant and being a looky-loo and talking theoretically about what kind of investments have done or what your fears are or looking in your rearview mirror, we're going to suggest that you make sure you discover what, when do you want how much money. When do you want how much money? At what age do you need how much money? If you want $40,000 out of an account in a year or so, and that would be a good supplement to your retirement income, you may discover at a 4% withdrawal, you need to set aside $1 million today. That's a fair amount of money for the majority of us. If it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you may discover that goal now becomes two, three, four, maybe even five million dollars. It becomes even more daunting. But if you use time to your advantage, start now. You won't be sorry. And we're going to suggest that if you're in your 20s, for example, you can afford market volatility. If you're in your 50s and your 60s and your 70s, maybe not so much. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Number five, apathy. Who cares? Whatever, right? Well, maybe that's not how it's going to work for you. I hope it won't. You won't let it work like that for you. Lack of interest or indifference causes people to avoid education opportunities and may even cause people to disengage from the investment process altogether. They just put their foot on the brake and cross their arms and said, I'm not doing it. And then they hope somebody's going to take care of them. Good luck with that. Have kids, <laughs> 12 of them, and let's see how many of them can take care of you after you've taken care of all 12. <laughs> I, I wouldn't make that my objective. Uh, number six, arrogance. Okay, People tend to rarely change their allocation even after there has been a significant change in their circumstances, like health, or their expectations. Okay, uh, Be willing to learn. Make sure that you are also willing to review your assumptions. Challenge them you know, at least once a year to see if your assumptions are in order. And looking at one of the statistics we found in terms of what it takes for people to be happy, we found that uh, the people who say they are the happiest, interestingly enough, on average spend about five hours a year looking at their financial situation. So just think of it like this. Most people spend more time planning their financial uh, spend less time planning their financial future than they do their, their, their vacations. So spend the same amount of time on your financial future as you do vacation, starting this year, all right? Five hours a year is what we're suggesting that you allocate to looking at your financial situation so that you can see, have I looked at everything we possibly can look at? Have we looked at it from the worst case scenario? And then if that doesn't happen, the worst case will probably be okay. If it's average or the best case, well, we know we'll be okay. But let's look at it from the worst case perspective. Number seven, passivity. People tend to rarely change their allocations, even though the markets or their goals may have changed. So as the markets fluctuate in value, that may be appropriate for you to review your assumptions. Inflation changes, interest rate changes, your time frame in terms of when you intend to be financially independent, any of those things change. You want to review your assumptions and your numbers. Now, if you're in your 20s or 30s, let the markets fall by 90%. Does it really matter? Maybe not. It certainly is not going to matter for you if you don't need this money today. So if you're in your 20s and 30s and the market's declining, you want to cheer and hope that your contribution has just been reached before the market went down on that day. If you're in your 50s or older, totally different scenario. And that leads me to a second piece here in terms of recognizing what your options are. We've talked a bit about... Um, 
making sure that you have more diversification, more than cash, bonds, or stocks in your investment strategies today. And we've also talked about active management strategies, where when it's a bad market, there are those who are looking at your 401k account, for example, and moving that money into defensive positions, moving out of bonds or out of stocks and into cash. And then when the markets are better, putting that money back in risky assets. Those kinds of options are available to 401k account holders two today. So check with your financial advisor to see how you might be able to take advantage of some of these mechanisms, if you will, these systems, some of the technology that's available today in managing your 401k and your other assets as well that we didn't have maybe 10 or 20, certainly 30 years ago. When we look at uh, 401ks, we're suggesting that you do a structural analysis, that you begin by looking for a disciplined process for identifying the range of portfolios within your 401k options and match your risk and return characteristics to your goals, all right? And don't try this at home. Uh, please give this the attention that it deserves. Hire all the help you possibly can. Uh, see what it costs and look at the value as in terms of the bottom line. Uh, and, and make sure that you're restructuring and rebalancing in terms of managing your 401k. Now, let me leave you with this. Please feel free to visit our website. It's www.ybpoor.com. Click on Contact Us. To the extent that you have questions, please give us your questions because, as I say, your questions, in fact, the questions that have come in drove us to have this conversation with you about the 401k and the seven sins that we've identified with you. We hope this has been helpful. Please give us your, your questions so that we can continue to be as helpful as possible. And subscribe, if you would, so that we make sure you don't miss a thing. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, the money doctor is out.